I am going to get us started if that's okay with you guys. Um, so again, thank you for joining us on uh, what is, uh, well, hopefully the air conditioning in your house is better than the heat outside. So hopefully this is a good deal instead of uh, having to be outside and barbecuing with your family or something fun like that, but, uh, or your neighbors, which we probably all ought to should be doing anyway. So uh, thanks for joining us. Um, hopefully you got the, you downloaded the uh, five missional environments or relational environments for mission. That was in the email that I sent out. If you uh, haven't, you may want to either get those on a PDF or print those out before we go that we're going to be going over that as we go. Um, just to remind you what the collective is, uh, the collective includes regular training for the whole collective. Um, we hope to get some retreats and seminars in here. Uh, it's for not only your individual congregation, but also for, um, it's for each individual congregation to be training with their pastors and their leadership. So we want your leadership teams to join us when we can. Um, it's offered as a benefit to SoCal congregations free of charge, but it's not just limited to SoCal. So if you have some uh, other churches that you'd like to, that may be interested in joining us, let us know about that. We can talk about that as well. Um, I think everybody's here part of it, so we don't have to worry about that as well. Just to let you know a little bit about SoCal, ed or SoCal etiquette, Zoom etiquette. Uh, if you would, it would be helpful if you could change your name so that it at least has your name, maybe part of your congregation of the city you're in. That will help Todd to get to know you a little better if he doesn't know you already. Um, in terms of audio courtesies, unless you're speaking, uh, go ahead and mute your mic to prevent any sound interference. We are going to record this, so if there's other people on your staff that you'd like to have watched this later, um, we'll post it on our SoCal site. But also, in addition to that, um, what happens when the speaker is speaking and somebody else coughs, the camera switches with Zoom. So it would be helpful if you um, would mute your mic. Same is true of your video camera. If you have to get up and grab some food or uh, go, uh, you know, I've had people sitting right in the camera with their bowl of cereal in the mornings, you know, munching off in the camera. And so that can be a little distracting. So if you can mute yourself, if you got to get up or especially if you have to turn around and pull up your zipper or something like that, make sure your camera's off. So that would be helpful. Uh, go ahead and open up the chat room. We'll be putting some stuff over there throughout the night if things come up. So we'll be posting comments over there. You can ask questions. You can use that as well. Or you can digitally raise your hands using the reactions button that's on you. On there, and then uh, depending on what your device, your device you're using, um, we can uh, unmute you or ask you to unmute yourself. Um, that is it on that stuff. Our next training, we try to do this quarterly um, as a group. Individually, your congregation can be doing stuff. Hopefully, you're getting the one-on-one -on -one coaching with Todd, and then also with your leadership team. So make sure you're taking advantage of that. But our next one is going to be in September. Um, the reason we're pushing it off until September is because, of course, we have the triennial this summer, which is focusing on hospitality, and uh, we'll be um, doing some stuff here locally with SoCal to bring everybody together. So um, that's one of the reasons why we're talking about the topics tonight. Todd and I talked about it and the theme of the triennial. And so when we talk about five uh, relational environments for mission, that's one of the topics that would fit into that. So we're going to kind of do a pre-conversation as we uh, head into the um, triennial. Any qu questions before we start? Nope. All right. And uh, let me pray and then um, we'll turn it over to Todd. Father, uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to gather tonight for the technology that allows us all to skip the commutes and uh, just be in and be out and be back with our family so quickly. Uh, but pr I pray that you would um, bless this conversation, help us to be. Um, alerts to what your spirit may be calling each of us to as we think about hospitality and being good neighbors and loving people in your name. We love you. And uh, we do pray also for Todd and Mike as they've uh, talked about their loss tonight and just pray uh, you would guide them uh, as they kind of navigate these new fields and grateful that your spirit is uh, the great comforter. Again, be honored in our time, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks for praying. Um, real quick, I wanted just a few in, encouraging things. Uh, Rick, I don't know if you other guys know him. Um, I met with Dave Heim from Friends Church in Anaheim. 
Yeah, very encouraging call with him. Good. Glad to hear that. He and he I had is, a great call too. So yeah. He's very much on the same page with everything we're talking about. Very much so. Surprising, yeah. surprisingly so. Based on where he's coming from. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Which he and I talked about. Yeah. So just so you guys know, uh, your Belinda Friends has been uh, planting campuses. And uh, in COVID, one of their campuses is led by Dave Heim. And Dave has, uh, COVID gave him permission to do it the way he wanted it instead of the way um, they have traditionally done it. And the way he wants to do it is exactly the conversation we're talking here, uh, the missional conversation. So uh, his, um, in fact, I, 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 I can't remember if I invited him to this tonight, but um, this would have been a good conversation for him to be in. Uh, yeah, so he he will be uh, hopefully joining us in this. So, yeah, right. glad um, you guys yeah. are able to connect. Very encouraging. So they're they're calling them house churches, basically missional communities. Um, but in terms of how they're trying to function, literally like pretty much exactly what we're talking about. But then they've got a second one that's also being planted. Um, do you remember what that? town was called it's out uh, by it's not as far as riverside it's more out by ontario in that area yeah, East yeah. Bay, something so like there's that. another one also planting um and again similar planting basically planting initial communities so interesting to see how that's going to play out because those two plants are planting in such a different fashion than the mothership. Um, but it's a great example of what's possible, actually. I, I've actually encouraged a bunch of existing churches in the past. They'll say, is it really possible to transition this 80-year-old church or this 50-year-old church? And I think, I think it is possible if a lot of things line up. But I said, if you don't have those circumstances to make it possible. One good option is that you would plant a healthy group of people out from there and just support the heck out of it and then see how it might bleed back into the mother church. And it, it's not going to probably totally, you know, transition the mother, but if it can get the mother church halfway there, wow, is that a big win. Yeah. or even 25 percent of the way there wow is that a big win and so um so i've, I've seen churches actually uh, basically do that as well um so so anyway there it's either going to affect the big mother church in yorba linda or they'll get cooked or they'll get kicked out <laughs> <laughs> and um uh, i didn't still be totally fine and um because they won't get kicked out i think until they're in a sustainable place anyway so they'll be able to they'll be fine they'll be able to continue on anyway one other thing one other encouragement um i don't know how much you guys work internationally but um i that's how i get to spend about 60 percent of my time probably there is so much cool stuff happening <laughs> um in different different places um, despite COVID. I mean, in the last 10 days, I've been in, on very encouraging calls with churches in Italy and Spain and Estonia um, and South Africa and England and Wales and Ireland. It was just in the last 10 days. And these churches, and again, many of them coming out of traditional formation you could say traditional denominations or and um they're just doing great stuff um and you know you hear italy spain that, that's very hard spiritual soil and yet despite the hard spiritual soil despite their traditional formation despite covid um things are really changing in how churches approach discipleship and mission um so anyway just to encourage you all however you're feeling about things locally or things around you in your city um 
lot of, a lot of beautiful stuff happening out there. So for tonight, actually, I was going to let you guys um, basically lead in a sense. Rick and I talked about two big themes, the one coming up with your triennial this summer based on hospitality. So what does hospitality look like in a missional community or, you know, in a, yeah, basically missional community, house church setting. But then that's why when he and I started talking about that, I was like, those five relational environments for mission would really fit well in here. Just for you to think about how you can give your people those categories to think about hospitality and, and mission and spending time with lost people. Um, different P, I'll just give this as a little intro that I want you guys to comment, ask questions, basically lead the conversation in that way so that we stay very practical and very specific to your context. But the big idea there is a lot of non-Christians out there, obviously different, different personality, different story, different circumstances, different family dynamics. They are going to be influenced at different times by different types of relationships. That's what we're getting there, getting at there. But many times churches will kind of, I would say, overemphasize one or two of those things rather than thinking about a combination of those things, a complementary, you know, complementary working of those things. And um, I, I think our churches are going to be much weaker if we do that. They're going to be much stronger if our people, again, are working together in their communities to, to create these different types of relational environments. Because you're going to have some non-Christian neighbors or co-workers or families from, you know, kids' school. You're going to have some that that like to, as a first step or as first steps, like to come into big anonymous environments. They don't want to be asked a lot of questions. <laughs> they don't want to be put on the spot. They want to come into a big anonymous environment and just check it out. Just look around. Just listen. And so you've got a lot of people on that side. You've got other people on the opposite side. They don't want to come into big. They don't like big groups. They don't like big crowds. They don't like big events. They like it small and personal. And so you can see one of those environments is very small. <clears throat> it's just a few people. It could be just a few women doing something together. It could be just a few men doing something together. But the idea is that it's small, it's personal, and that is that that's the open door into certain people's lives. Some people fall into the middle. I remember um, um, this one woman, single mom who became a Christian through our missional community. The first step for her was to come to a backyard party where there were about there were about 35 people present. So it was kind of anonymous. It was kind of personal. I actually remember this so clearly. This is some years ago. Um, I remember this so clearly. She shows up at this backyard party, this backyard meal we were having. 35 people there, probably 15 of them or so were non-Christians. But the goal of the night was just to eat, play some cornhole. There was some music on. So basically eat, have fun, build relationship. Because we knew, you know, 15 non-Christians there, the goal was just to love them well and to introduce them to other Christians. So she shows up and I remember meeting her. I met her right, right on the steps of the, the deck, wooden deck. And um, really quickly, she was like, Again, this is the first time I've ever met her. <laughs> but literally within probably five minutes into getting to know her, she's like looking around and she was like, this, this is different. <laughs> um, she was like, this is cool. 
look, you've got all these people enjoying each other, enjoying food, enjoying the music, enjoying the cornhole, um, the games we were playing. She was like, this is, uh, I, lo I love this, she said. She said, do you guys do anything else? What, like, what is this? And I told her, it's like, well, we've got a few of these groups of people that live a lot of life together like this, actually. We eat a lot of meals together, throw a lot of parties together. So we actually do this quite often. She was like, really? Can I come to something else? <laughs> it's like, you doing anything in you doing anything in the next few weeks that I could come to? And I was like, well, yeah, every other week we do like a we do like a meal night it's with a smaller group of people, maybe 10 or 12. So basically she asked if she could come to our missional community. That party was actually a party with like three missional communities doing the party together. So you'll see that relational environment I describe is multiple missional communities, multiple house churches working together, throw a party, throw a game night, throw a bigger meal, throw a big holiday party, big Christmas party, big 4th of July party, but something bigger with more energy. But that first step was so key for her. And then sure enough, she showed up two weeks later to our missional community and the rest is history. Not long later, she became, became a Christ follower and um, yeah, really, really changed her life. But again, the, the, the entry point, that, that's part of what we're getting at here. The entry point into her life was the medium sized relational environment, 35 people. Then it became two weeks later, the next size down, the missional community size of 10 to 12. And then guess what happened after that? After she got introduced to the missional community, she went deeper with a few of the women. And sure enough, <laughs> she said, do you guys do anything else? And our women was like, yeah, well, we've got these little groups of women that meet just together as women. Um, she was like, bang, could I check that out? And my wife was leading one of those at the time. She's like, well, what do they do there? Well, they study the Bible. They talk about life. They talk about marriage. You talk about parenting. She was like, oh, again, think think non-Christian, but interested non-Christian. That sounded like good news to her. It didn't repel her because she had already seen us function at the backyard party. And then she had seen us function together as a missional community at our family meal night. So then the smaller group of four women meeting that she could join to talk about the Bible, that like didn't scare her. It didn't repel her. It actually was like, oh, that sounds like another cool stuff. <laughs> so I'm going to step into that with these people. So she basically went from, from the medium size group to the missional community size group to the DNA size group. And then she actually came to one of our larger sun Sunday gatherings, you know, with like three, 400 people there. So anyway. One example of one person, but how those different environments worked together in complementary fashion to bring her into community and to eventually bring her to Jesus. So I'll sit that there. <laughs> what comments, questions, pushback do you have? <laughs> Todd, how did she get to that first gathering again? Uh, was, was she invited by uh, just one of the people in, in the missional community? Just, we have this going on, come and, come and join us. Yeah, public school teacher invited by another Christian public school teacher. Those are yeah, so the 15, so the 15 non-Christians that were there that I told you about at that bigger backyard event, meal, 
game night. Um, yeah, they all they all would have been there because of personal invitations. They were either neighbors, coworkers, families from school. Was that a with kids event? So the kid were were the kids all part of that? Yeah. But because we weren't to try and to accomplish any teaching moment or any formal meeting moment, the kids yeah, were just all the kids were yeah. just all part, kids were just all part of the fun. Yeah, just have a fun night uh, with families. So actually, for the non Christians who came with kids, again, they're kind of like, "Wow, this is awesome! <laughs> it's safe for one thing, you know. It's fun." It's safe, it's fun, it's relational. And it seems like these people are even kind of like looking out for our kids. Because they're, they're, they're looking out well for their kids. And while they're looking out well for their kids, it seems like they're looking out well for our kids. Like, where does that happen? Lisa raised her hand. Sorry, say that again. Lisa, Banning, Lisa and Joe Banning raised their hand. Okay. Good evening. Two questions. Uh, Joe's really curious after the follow up. So to Mike McNeff's question, how did she come to the original event? And then of curiosity for Joe, what happens in that two week span from the first pleasant intro to the next? And my question is, if we can fold in this evening's conversation, how we create some of these environments for the discipleship of people that are joining us virtually because it's still such a silver lining of the pandemic experience so how do we get relational in a new way that maybe is a little foreign to us still love those questions yeah great question great questions <laughs> plural um so you heard how i said she got invited the, to the first thing right Okay, invited by another teacher friend who was a Christian at her public school. So real easy, coworker. Um, so again, when, when your communities start to function like this consistently, it all works together and it all potentially builds on each other. So you can imagine she gets invited to that party, that meal by this teacher. But what do you think they're gonna do the next day in the teacher's lounge? Well, what what are they likely to do? Well, sure. If it's if it's purposeful and the mission is well articulated, they're adding up what worked and the pleasant surprises the gal experienced, and the next in entree to sharing the gospel for the gal that invited her. So again, as we're training our people to live this way, that public school teacher is a Christian. She knows, she understands relationship. She understands intentionality. And so the next day at school in the teacher's lounge, she's saying, what did you think of that last night? How did you feel there? Oh, man, I felt great. People approached me, had genuine conversation with me, asked me some good questions, loved it. I even asked if I could come to the next thing. Okay. So, guy, cool, cool stuff. <laughs> I don't want to get us off track here, but I got to tell you such a cool part of how this story played out like a year later. So she comes to follow Jesus, okay? Then her, hus her husband had two affairs, which we had to walk through with her. The second affair led to their divorce. So our missional community really became her family. Very difficult circumstances. So she had two children with that guy. Um, she needs to provide as a single mom for those two children. Their school age. And so she needs to figure out a way for them. She needs to be at school at 7 a.m. every morning. Her kids don't need to be at school until 7.30 a.m. every morning. So she's talking to our missional community, telling us about that. She's like, I don't know what to do. Dilemma. Somebody in the missional community says, well, you know what? Mornings, like I actually have a little block of time. You could drop them off at my house and then I'll drop them off at school. No way. 
no way. Again, she's a baby Christian at this point. She's like, who would do that? You're saying five mornings a week, I can drop my kids off at your house for 30 minutes, and then you're going to drop them off at school? Like, who would do that? So it's like, that's what servanthood looks like. <laughs> that's what family looks like. And so this person, part of the mission community, started doing that for her. <clears throat> she goes to school. And she's in the teacher's lounge. Some of the teachers are asking, like, what, what are you doing with your kids these days? It's like, how's that working out? Because, um, you know, are you able to drop them off before you come in? She's like, no, here's what's happening. There's this group of people, um, part of my church now, that live a lot of life together, support each other like family, very generous, very servant-minded. They're taking care of my kids every morning. Non-Christian teachers in the teacher's lounge, blowing their minds. Blowing their minds. They're like, how, how, much are, how much are you paying? What are you, what are you paying these guys to take care of your kids for 30 minutes and drop them off five days a week? Nothing. Nothing. That can't be possible. That can't be possible. Why would they do that? And that, for this baby Christian... Guess what she did? She did. She said they do it because they they think that's what it looks like to follow Jesus. It looks like you care for each other like family. You're generous. You're hospitable. So we'll tie in the hospitality theme. You're generous. You're hospitable. You're sacrificial. You're thoughtful. You're genuine. So she shares this awesome gospel presentation basically to this teacher's lounge lounge full of non-christian teachers she's just baby christian at this point but think of what led to that was there anything like very difficult in all of that and the the person who volunteered to do that for her kids just normal just normal, thoughtful, available Christian. Hate to say it like this, but not, on the surface, nothing special. No big leader, not leading a missional community, just part of a missional community. No big leader, but very much a servant. Very much ready, available to love this single mom now, like family. Powerful, powerful. So anyway, that was a little bit of a side note, but it's so good because of how the missional community came around her in the middle of those two affairs. And in, then in the middle of that divorce and basically took her in like family, cared for her kids like family, helped take care of her house I was over there multiple times mowing her yard because she didn't have a mower and her grass was about a foot high. It's what you do for family. It's what you do. Mow, mow grass and we painted, painted her 10 year old daughter's bedroom purple. It was like, I had a hard time. I like to paint, but I like to, paint certain colors in a certain way. It was hard for me to paint purple on those walls. But the whole time it's just like, this is what it looks like to love that 11 year old or that 10 year old girl. This is what it looks like to love this single mom in this moment. Paint this God awful color on this wall. So, so what about, else? Do you, that second question she asked, I think, is relevant too. Do you want to address that now, or do you want to save that for later? In terms of discipleship in a digital world. Um, well, actually, when she asked the question, actually, a different aspect of it came to mind. Okay, but we can come back to that aspect of it too. The aspect of it that came to mind is that. Um, a lot of people, I heard it this morning, I was on a call with a big group of leaders in Estonia. They said, man, 
people all over Estonia, they're just, they're exhausted from Zoom. They're exhausted from video. So where the conversation went, Estonia is a very cold place for nine months out of the year. But they, they actually liked this idea, even though they live kind of the opposite of here. Um, I just said, you need to maximize outdoor spaces. You can't meet inside right now, the law says, or you know, the guidelines say, but the guidelines still say you can meet with five to 10 people outside. That's the current restrictions in Estonia. So I said, you gotta maximize that. Tell me where you can go, tell me what you can do on a consistent basis that's relational, that's gonna put you face to face with non-Christian Estonians in outdoor spaces. And that's the, honestly the conversation I've been having with churches all over the world the last six months. Maximize, especially for now, because you have to maximize outdoor spaces. So at, at another church I work with in Southern England, um, they're going for long walks in the rain because it's raining there most days. They're going for long walks in the rain with their non-Christian neighbors. And it's life-giving. Because it's an excuse for their non-Christian neighbors to get out of the house. It's one of the few opportunities their non-Christian neighbors have to get face-to-face -face with people. And it might sound miserable putting on your galoshes and going for long walks in, you know, damp, soggy rain. But they're, they're experiencing beautiful things in the lives, both of their non-Christian relationships and in the core leaders. Because they're asking the same question, Lisa, like, how do we invest in our leaders during this time? We can't be under a roof with them. They, they're not very motivated to get on Zoom. What can we do? Going for walks with them. Going for walks with them. And kind of a funny bonus, I've heard, I've heard more than one tell me, and we're in much better shape than we were pre-COVID. All of these long walks with leaders, all of these long walks with non-Christians, drop some pounds. Um, we're in, we're in good health, better than, better than pre-COVID. So, but basically maximizing what non-Christians are available for. So my, my gospel community here in San Diego, we're, we're just spending a lot of time at the park, honestly. Lots of, lots of activities at the park. With kids, scooters, volleyball, frisbee, um, sometimes in our yard, in our driveway. We had two non-Christian families over today. Um, we've got girls the girls age of these two non-Christian families. They were just, they just left our house like 90 minutes ago. And just, we did a little play date in the driveway. Because it's hot, they did water balloons. They bumped a volleyball. Uh, they're like 10, 11 years old. So our gospel communities are doing a lot of those things. Consistent, relational, but outside because that's what's available right now. We can't do meals in our home. We can't do bigger parties in our home. We can't do those bigger events in a building, but we can do a lot of things outside. We're doing a lot of things around a fire pit at night. Um, a lot of, lot of fire pits, um, inviting people, um, inviting people into that. So, so Lisa, that's another aspect of saying these, these opportunities aren't available right now, but there's a whole lot of opportunities that still are available, okay? But then I, I honestly don't have a good answer for your, uh, for your Zoom or your online. Um, I hear of some churches doing things like Alpha and other discussion-based meetings with non-Christians, and they're, they're quite fruitful. So that is happening around the world right now. 
that is being quite fruitful in different places right now. But it seems like it takes the right kind of people and the right kind of circumstances for them to have an appetite to spend more hours on video. So if I, so, could, if I could just speak into that a little bit, um, I would, uh, we have found, yes, everybody's got Zoom fatigue, but uh, nobody wants to get into the uh, Southern California traffic either. So <laughs> there is, uh, if you've got to drive 20 minutes, a half an hour to get to your small group meeting or your discipleship meeting or stuff like that, then um, that makes it a little more difficult. Plus, you know, if you've got a congregation with a lot of young families, your time limit, your, your time is limited. So my, my DNA group, for example, we have a, uh, a guy with rhabdomyolysis, however you say that. And he is, because of that, he has serious, like he's exhausted. He can't do a whole lot. Uh, he's got two young kids. One just was born last January, uh, right before COVID started. Um, he is making, his whole life is getting to his doctors and, and back. His body is eating itself. I mean, this guy's firefighter, you know, big muscles, tattoos all over himself before this happened and his body's wasting away. So, but he lives for, I mean, he's the first guy to say, Hey, are we meeting this week? And, um, we, he can't meet in person. And so he's one of the ones. And then, uh, you, amazingly enough, my group is pretty scattered anyway. So everybody's going to be driving 10 or 15 minutes to get to get to each other. So it allows us to be able to, when we start, we jump in, there's no travel time. You know, we're not spending 40 minutes, 50 minutes getting to or from, it's not late at night on the roads and stuff like that. So there's a little bit of, we're finding that with a lot of our groups, we started telling some of our DNA groups, you can start meeting in person. And some of them are like, but it's, a, it's more convenient this way. Uh, so and we also have some of our long distance folks. We have a, an elderly woman in Nevada discipling two young girls. One is in Santa Barbara, the other one's in Phoenix, Arizona. And so it's created opportunities that way. Those are our DNA groups. That's different than our communities. The communities, again, you're gonna wanna have a little bit more of that social time. It's harder to invite a non-believer into that. But we had, you know, we've done everything from, uh, we had a Passover Seder and had a Jewish lady jump on. And my goodness, she took over in a very God orchestrated way in terms of like asking questions about, you know, this is what I grew up with, but I didn't know. I thought Jesus was a Christian. I didn't know he was Jewish. <laughs> so we had really great, but all of that's digital. So um, I wouldn't discredit digital. Uh, there is there is a huge place for that, but somehow now this is a new realm that we've got to learn to play with in the midst of it can happen uh, and it can happen effectively. And uh, we just yeah. uh, like I would never believe that you could do alpha that way. But like you said, Todd, uh, even in Costa Mesa, they're doing alpha online and, and it's they're having great results with it. Yeah. Yeah. So at least I think it's a combination. Uh, again, this is a DNA environment. So like myself with my three guys or my wife with her four gals, their, her DNA, probably one out of three or four is digital. So we're still doing a lot of it in person because I, I, I'm still a big proponent of physical, physical contact and physical presence, um, which you don't get over Zoom. Um, you also don't get yummy dessert and yummy drinks um together uh, that you get to enjoy um so we do a lot of that but my dna guys are meeting in person most times and then supplementary again we've all got a lot of kids busy lives occasionally we'll say how about if we just do zoom tonight and we'll we'll check in for 90 minutes over zoom so somebody asked about alpha Alpha is an experience, it's basically an introduction to Christianity, where under normal circumstances, you would spend an hour eating together, you eat a meal together, so it's basically hosted in a home, or it could be at a church, but a meal is hosted the first hour, and then the second hour, the non, you're basically creating, creating a discussion environment, so 
I love the alpha approach. We've approached it differently through the years. We use a tool called the story of God. I like it a little more alpha is a little more topical, not bad, just topical. The story of God is really, um, as you would assume, <laughs> it's pieces of the Bible in story form that are leading to a progression from creation to the fall to Jesus to um, Coma, you know, his return. So that's what the story of God is. But we do the same thing with the story of God. Missional community will host it, somebody's home. Uh, the first hour, we eat a meal together, relational, yummy um, meal together. Second hour, we do that one hour um, discussion around the story of God. And it's just a very warm, safe environment for non-Christians. It's set up in such a way that they could have zero Bible knowledge and feel totally comfortable there. Those Bible answer people that you know, they're actually not allowed to, <laughs> um, they're not allowed to do their thing. They're not allowed to be the Bible answer people. It, it's set up in such a way that you can only answer any of the questions from the piece of the story that night. You can't bring any extra training, education, biblical sources. <laughs> you can't bring anything else into it. So it's, it, it, it's awesome. We've, we've actually used it all over the world and um, tons of fruit, tons of fruit from using the story of God with non-Christians. It's on my site. There's two versions of it. Um, and there's actually a um, story of God for kids version that I could send you if you're interested. Very cool. We've gone through parts of it with our kids at different times. But um, the story of God is on our, my site in two different forms, a 10-part version and a four-part version. The idea with the four-part version is certain Christians or non-Christians are going to invite into it. They're not going to hang around for 10. They're not going to hang around for 10 meetings, but they will commit to four meetings. But you'll get some longer term relationships with non-Christians where they would commit to 10 meetings. I think Alpha usually goes like eight, six or eight. So Good stuff. Good questions. What else? What What's on your minds? What are you thinking about for your... When you think of those five environments, I'm curious, think about your Orange County environment. Which of those would you, if you had to like rate them, which would you say are more effective or more common? Which would you say are le less effective, less common? What do you think? Well, and, and maybe which ones your congregation does well or doesn't what do well. Good. Somebody jump. Uh, Todd, I think it depends on the relationship with uh, with the people that may be coming. So, um, so we just had a woman who joined one of our groups, which is looking to be a missional community, and um, but she came to church first because she was looking for a church. Yep, so she great. is likely she is likely already a believer. Um, so she was looking for a place to connect in. So obviously for her, coming to the larger group was, was a good entry point. That's not gonna be the best entry point for people. So if you're talking of a, te you know, a friend of a teacher at school, um, the best entry point is exactly what you described. Um, so, so again, I, I think, um, you know, if it's if it's somebody looking for a church, probably 
the larger setting is going to be good because they can come. And if they like it, then they'll they'll seek somebody out to find out more. Um, that same person, or or if there's a person with no no church background and no relationship, I think a smaller group is going to be a lot more intimidating for them. Not likely to come if there's no relationship because they can't they can't be uh, anonymous there. Yeah. So. Uh, again, I think, uh, so whatever stage they are in the relationship with the people that they're there is probably going to determine that. Good. Great comments. As you said that, Mike, I was thinking of another non-Christian. Let me tell you about her journey in the five steps quick. So went to high school with a Christian, she's not a Christian, went to high school with a Christian friend lost contact with each other, reconnected through some crazy way. They, they realized they ran into each other somewhere at a park or something, found out they lived like five blocks from each other, hadn't seen each other for 10 years. So they're talking, I don't know how they started talking about spiritual things because she was very much not, she was very much not a Christian, <laughs> okay? But, she starts talking with this Christian friend. I think she actually inquired and said, I remember back to high school, you were kind of a spiritual person. You still, you still into that? And so she said, I'd, I'd kind of like to check it out. I've been like, something's been going on. I'm kind of curious. So she, so our friend told her about the missional community. She was like, no, I don't want to do that. Anything else you do? Well, yeah, we meet Sunday mornings in a pretty normal church setting. Would you want to do that? Oh, perfect. So isn't it interesting? She trusted this high school friend. She did not trust her missional community or that idea. She didn't want to come into that environment. She wanted to show up and literally she showed up for like eight Sunday mornings in a row. Anonymous. Didn't want anybody to talk to her. Just wanted to check it out and see if it was a cult. Because that's what was on her mind. Okay. Christians, cults. And about eight weeks into it, she says, okay, I'm ready. I'd love to check out your missional community now. So she went. Individual high school friend. Sunday morning gathering missional community meal. And then just like that other single mom I told you about, she heard about the DNA idea and studying the Bible, jumped into it. First night at this women's DNA, I mean, brings chills when I think about it. They basically hand her a Bible so she can see what they're reading. She said, first, first time I've ever seen one of these First, first time I've ever had one in my hands. Never really seen one, never touched one, never had one in my hands, for sure never read one. That first night they were doing a little discussion around something in Ephesians. She took voracious notes that night. And then she became a Christian about three months later. Nothing special. Old high school friend being intentional, sensitive, listening. Okay, she doesn't want to come to missional community. What's appropriate? Okay, Sunday morning. So yeah, Mike, it's going to depend on stage of spiritual interest. Also personality, though. A lot of it. Personality where people feel safe, comfortable, kinds of environments they feel cared for. So yeah, I, I think that was you commenting, Rec. That's the real hospitality question right there. If, we church, have a if your church is gonna major in hospitality, you've got to take all these things into consideration. It's so much not a one size fits all thing. You've got neighbors and they're all different and their love languages are all different. 
and what they like to do and how they think, how, where they grew up, what their family dynamic is, all different. You've got to be sensitive to those things. Say, what kind of environments can we create that is going to serve them well, love them well, help us get into their story? Sometimes it's going to be two or three women together. Sometimes it's going to be a mixed group around a meal. Sometimes it's going to be a little larger group at the park. Sometimes it's going to be a large group at a birthday party or a holiday party. But it's all of those combination of things usually working together. So that's how I personally, you can disagree with me, that's how I would define biblical hospitality. Sorry, you were going to say something before that, Mike. Jump. Um, actually, actually, I was just, um, Steve, Moshni is on with this uh, because I didn't send him the link soon enough. <laughs> so uh, welcome, Steve. He's been um, working with a guy named Muhammad. Steve is doing um, some Arabic ministry, actually taking over um, for um, Azad, who was doing it. But okay. I, you know, Steve, could you could you just kind of tell us what Muhammad's journey has been? I mean, there's there's about eight or nine that been working with but he's there every sunday right now so um you could it's an encouraging story can you unmute unmute yourself steve actually rick you can unmute him oh, okay i mean sorry yeah mohammed has been the one that's been the most um it seems to be putting forth the effort and seems to have the greatest hunger of the uh of the Arabs that we're working with right now. And uh, he just, he comes from Egypt and he married a girl uh, when he, he always loved the Lord and he always, even though he was Muslim, but he, he married a Muslim girl. And even though he is Muslim, he is Muslim, but he always loved the Lord and he married a Muslim girl. And then he really had an experience with the Lord and really wanted to follow the Lord. But, there was a lot of pressure from his family, the, uh, the, especially the wife's family. The wife's family is from Sudan. And, uh, you know, it got so bad that, you know, he had to, he had to leave. And he went to Dubai and, uh, you know, the United Arab Emirates, and then was able to find his way to the United States. And he's been in New York for, uh, for, He's been there for quite a while, you know, in New York, but he never got his citizenship or green card or anything like that. And uh, he, he even, this is a, a common situation with uh, Muslims who come to the Lord uh, in the Middle East, which is that they'll go to a church and say, hey, you know, I want to know about Jesus. And I've, I had dreams about Jesus or, or, you know, quite often there's a supernatural type of yep, yep. manifestation. And, uh, and, and the churches will say, oh, but, but, but uh, God made you a Muslim and he made us Christians and, and God bless you and your wonderful peace, peaceful religion that we love so much because we love Muslims so much. And, you know, and, you know, they watch a lot of CNN over there. And so uh, anyway, the, uh, so anyway, he found his way to America and he was in New York for several years. And then he came, he came here to California, and he's uh, he's trying to get his citizenship, trying to get his refugee status. He, he doesn't even have refugee status yet, and so he's just at the very beginning stages, and he's just standing on his feet. He doesn't have a social security card. He doesn't, but he works. He works uh, for this Arab guy delivering flowers, which has been enough to keep him, you know, pay for his bills and stuff like that. He rents a room. And, uh, but he's been coming to church, you know, faithfully, you know, he got baptized, you know, he started doing the classes with Pastor Azad, first of all, discipleship classes, he cool. devoured it, and then, uh, and then he uh, got baptized, and then Pastor Azad left and went to San Diego, and that's kind of when I kind of started working with him, and so, um, this guy is, you know, he's so faithful. Every Sunday he's there. Uh, he tries to understand. A lot of it he doesn't understand, but 
He always writes down questions that he has about the sermon. And then we meet together on Tuesday mornings at 830. And he just comes with all these questions, man. And you know what? I'm just teaching him everything that I can, you know, because he's, he's at a stage right now where he's eating everything. He'll eat everything. And he just devours everything, man. And so we've been having some really excellent uh, discipleship uh, sessions with him. He has, you know, we've dealt with issues of the Trinity. With Muslims, the big problems are the Trinity, the deity of Jesus Christ, the dual nature of Jesus Christ. And, and then sometimes you have to deal with Islam and talk about the misconceptions in Islam. With him, you, you really don't have to because he apparently wasn't one of the Muslims who really knew a lot. He didn't really know a lot about Islam, which is really the case of most Muslims. So uh, anyway, it's been really great to see his hunger. And while he's hungry, while he's like that, you know, he's got that desire. We're just uh, trying to input everything we can into him. And, uh, and as, as well as uh, getting him to get into relationships with other believers in the church and you know yeah. they all love him and he loves them you know uh, especially like Rhonda and Dwayne you know David and Valerie and, and stuff like that Nathan and Joanne so uh so that's been one of our uh, bright spots in the uh the Arab ministry you know so we praise the Lord for that you know yeah it doesn't usually get to come that easy that you know the rest of them are a little bit harder you got to pull, it's like pulling teeth to get them to come to church. But uh, with him, he comes by himself and he's got a real hunger. And so that's a really, a real blessing, you know, to see that. So Great, great, great. Good stuff. Rick, did you say somebody else had a question? Had yeah. Up? yeah, Derek had his hand raised up. Derek, I don't know if you still have your question. I was a really not a question, but it was kind of more of a statement about, you know, seeing this from the perspective of these multiple gatherings and the entry point. And it just seems like having all of them collectively gives you the opportunity to bring somebody in that might be more, you know, ready for a small, intimate conversation and then move them into a larger group too, because, you know, they need that. They need to eventually experience a larger family gathering, you know, and that, that, that feeling and vice versa to start somebody that might be more used to being in a larger group and funneling them into a smaller group so they can get that intimate relationship built, you know? Great comments. Absolutely. What's, what's interesting is that whole relational dynamic, you know, is really in play as we think about discipling Christians as well. Christians need that same combination of relational environments for, for our personal growth. You need to be better around bigger groups sometimes. You need an intimate relationship with a few sometimes. You need to be in mixed groups sometimes. You need to be with younger people sometimes. You need to be with older people sometimes. The same relational dynamic is actually in play for Christians, for our growth, for our discipleship. So this is just another variation of it as we think about the non-Christians um, around us. I would go back to, to the question about the kids because kids can fit into just about all of these levels except like the one-on-one -on -one and the smaller DNA groups because um, one, of, one of my favorite experiences for our community was we had a guy show up that uh, clearly had been living the rough side of life for a while and uh, we had a night it was just a game night around the table and all of the teenagers around the table were playing games we played really late he and uh, the person he came with and and her daughter were the last ones to leave that night and uh, they left and the next day we heard they'd gone to visit another family that was in our community and the family came back and said, uh, this guy has never been and had never had a good time without it involving drugs or alcohol. So that he sat around with a bunch of teenagers playing games until late one night on a Friday was a completely new experience for him. 
and uh, you know the conversations were mostly with the adults and stuff like that. But uh, the kids became part of that. You know, that environment. They were part of the key to to that being a good night for him. Cool. Well, actually, interesting. You bring up the kids thing too. I would say, you know, with those different environments that you're that you just you know were commenting on. <clears throat> some of those can be organized in such a way that kids are being cared for at home or in another, so that actually you don't have the kid distraction. If you're trying to do something, have a certain conversation that's gonna benefit from not having kids present. Does that make sense? So sometimes, like I said, my wife, uh, my wife's an evangelist, so she's doing relational stuff with non-Christian women all the time. One of the things she likes to do, she organizes these jewelry making nights. She'll just get some supplies, and they're not very expensive, and they'll make these cool earrings, and they'll spend, they'll spend a couple hours doing that. They'll have something yummy to eat while they're making the earrings, but what do you think they're doing for two hours? Talking building deep building deep relationship with each other okay but the point is um i'm babysitting the kids and the other dads are babysitting the kids so these women can have this awesome two two and a half hours together undistracted no kids coming in saying mommy i need this or um so the men are taking the child care off of the you know <laughs> um taking childcare off of them so that, so that they can be making these relation, these deep relational investments into the lives of these non-Christian women while they are eating dessert and making earrings. So same, we, we do the other thing the other direction where the women will you know, just say, man, we want you guys to go out and do a guy thing. And you're gonna invite some of your non-christian guy friends and you're going to do something guys like to do don't worry about the kids we're freeing you up um stay out late because we know you're going to be intentional and relationally invest in these other men but derek to your point so i think everybody's seeing the potential here and uh i think everybody's getting that but you've got to say, okay, how are we going to train our churches? How are we going to train our people to organize their lives that way? How are we going to train our people to organize their small groups or their community groups that way? That's the challenge. So one of the things I wrote down as somebody was talking, I said, no surprise, you have to help your people learn how to plan their lives, plan their schedules, plan their groups in this way. It ain't just gonna happen. You can't just talk about it and expect it to uh, happen magically. Yes, you do need to talk about the why behind it. And then you need to talk about the how behind it. But then the most important work is you helping your people actually figure out how to plan their busy lives around it. Because that's the challenge in the American church today. I, I get nauseated because I hear it with the job I do working with different churches in so many different places, day in and day out. How do you get your people to live on mission when they're living their busy lives? It's exhausting answering that question. And you, you guys have heard me talk about it before, so I'm not even going to answer it. <laughs> I'm not even going to answer that again right now. But I have found with, there's no way the average American Christian pursuing the, the American dream in Orange County, there's no way they're going to live their life with more intentionality if you don't hold their hand at some point and help them think about how to plan their schedule intentionally. Ain't going to happen doesn't come intuitively to most people and again the american dream and their busy schedules and their kids schedules are fighting against all this 
Yes. And and their understanding of church is fighting against all this that they're going to church already. So so that that's a lot of um, a lot of the job. Yep. Good so I'll, I'll be... Yeah. So churches are the ones keeping them the busiest sometimes. Yep. I had a conversation with my uh, senior guy at one point about uh, I needed to have more nights at church and why I, I needed to figure out another uh, more time to get at church. So Derek's got his hand raised again. Can I say something to that point quick so I don't lose it? I had a conversation with a guy in South Africa two days ago. To your point, Rick, he was like, I'm so busy taking care of Christians and taking care of meetings. He said, what, how do I find time in my schedule for mission for lost people? It's like, that's scary for one thing. In light of Jesus calling, in light of Jesus example, 80% of his time was, was with non-Christians. Like, what are you doing? So, but I told him a remedy because he was, he was asking, okay, what do I do? How do I change that? I said, when you set your weekly schedule and your monthly schedule, guess where you start? Not with meetings and not with the 99 from the church. You set your schedule, your daily, weekly, monthly schedule. You started with mission. You started with lost people. That's where you build your schedule first. And then you see if you have time to a lot to the others. And you guys know what I'm saying. We obviously, we obviously live in that tension and need to balance out the care of shepherding the sheep, developing leaders. But oftentimes I think we've got it upside down. Leaders set their schedules full of Christians, full of meetings, and then maybe there's a little left over for lost people. Does not seem like that was the way of Jesus. Seems like he flipped that. He actually said, I'm going to develop my leaders as I spend time with non-Christians. That's going to be the best leadership development. I'm going to develop them as I spend time with lost people. And then there will be enough left over because we need to rest sometimes. So we'll rest at the side of the lake and we'll rest on the hillside. And then I'll talk to my followers. I'll talk to the Christians. So he found time, obviously, to shepherd the sheep. But it was in the gaps, I believe, between loving and pursuing lost people. Does anybody hate me after that comment? Derek's got his hand up still. Sorry, go ahead, Derek. Yeah, I was just gonna, you know, <clears throat> maybe pull into that conversation too. And, you know, one thing that stands out to me is, is these large, big events. And you mentioned something earlier about having multiple churches coming together to create these large events and it, it Mul just, mul multiple small groups coming together or more or multiple small groups i mean from i guess i'm looking at it from a perspective of you know our church palm harvest is a, is a is a very small congregation so you know in essence it would it would almost be beneficial to have other small groups from other churches gather together to make a large, large event to bring in multiple people from all over the place and, and create that really, you know, open environment for people to be at. Absolutely. Absolutely. You could do that. You could do that. Yep. We've done, we've done it and we've done it. We've done some of that in different ways through the years. Um, certain missional, I don't know what to call it, missional progress. We had a focus for a pretty long season, two or three years on homeless single moms. 
Well, ma'am, you want to talk about the relational, emotional, physical needs there. Very demanding. <laughs> Very demanding. And so we would, you know, we had partnership with a few other churches around. We let them know first Monday night of every month. It's happening at this location, 6 to 8 p.m. We need, we need help at every level. We need people sitting at the tables, eating meals with these moms. We need help taking care of their 30 kids. We need help sitting with them as we do life skills training. We need help at all levels during that six to eight period, six to eight time period. You wanna help with that? Beautiful way to get, you know, one or two small groups that feel called to that stuff from over here, one or two from over here. It's like, why does that have to be limited to one church? Like, so they can get credit for it? Like, you know, not at all. And when we do that stuff, Derek, like you're alluding to, it brings capacity, brings relational capacity, get more hands brings emotional capacity for the relationships, brings financial capacity, certain stuff you're gonna to wanna to do if you're serving poor, homeless, single moms, uh, people who lost their jobs, there's gonna be some financial needs there. Always nice to have more financial capacity, isn't it? As we're trying to serve those needs. But often we, we just don't think creatively, we don't think outside the box, we don't think outside our church walls. And so we just limit ourselves. We limit our capacity. Great comments. Andy Chung, is he out there? Does he have any thoughts? You never know with those um, neutral screens. He's actually in his pajamas and doesn't want to show himself. He has a newborn, so uh, I think he's trying to be kind to us in case the baby decides to. That's fair. Hey, Todd, I'll be meeting with one of our groups here in the next couple of weeks that have, they've already made, it's a, it's a group actually that Steve was referring to and he's been a part of. And um, we are looking to this group to be um, to be really our first well-defined missional community. So we have, we have a number of groups meeting and they're, they're into it. Um, so this is probably a coaching question. And, and, uh, so if it gets too much, especially at this point, then you and I can, can maybe, uh, talk later before I would meet with them, but, uh, they're looking at, yeah, they're looking at what are, what are the irreducible, um, uh, factors of, of a missional community, the, the things that must be in place in order uh, to do it. Again, I, I see a lot of the stuff there already. What, what it seems like they're missing to me is, uh, is having the kind of events that you kind of uh, began with tonight. And that is um, just a, a fun night where they have already um, introduced some some people to so in other words uh, uh, an event where they would bring people entry point and yep. and just for fun so an entry yeah an entry point for that group they're doing a lot of um things that would help to meet neighbors and things like that but I, it seems like they haven't yet um said this is who we're going after uh for this next six months so any, if you could five minutes or less um say here here are some of the irreducible things in order for for them to get off the ground the irreducibles that are always talk about i'll just say they limited to four things i could expand on a few of them but the first one is um shared leadership and again you've heard me talk about these things before mike so shared leadership we can't live in this way in a sustainable we can't live in a sustainable way. We can't do these things in a sustainable way alone or with one or two people. 
healthy missional community has got to have strong core leadership. I always say minimum of four. This is just based on years and years and years of experience. Minimum of four, preferably six, seven. Second thing, clear about who the mission is. So clearly define mission. Often groups will bite off this massive thing and say, our vision is the whole neighborhood. <laughs> We're on mission to these 300 families or the whole neighborhood. Well, it's not reasonable. It's not sustainable. It's not possible. It's impossible. So clearly defined mission, missional community needs, I believe is praying together and discerning who are the 10 to 15 lost people you're going to love like crazy. You're going to invite to the little things, the big things, the men things, the female things, the holiday things, the, those 10 to 15 people are gonna get invited every time you host something and you're going to love them well. You're gonna pursue their stories deeply. Okay, that, that was number two. Number three is a plan. I already said it, so this is just reinforcing. If you're clear on the mission, who those people are and how you're going to spend time with them, it needs to take that next critical step to having a clear plan for it to happen. I see so many churches, they have got good intentions. They are good hearted people. They've got good intentions, but it never gets there because it never gets into the specific plans. Serious, I, serious, yeah. Number four, um, supernatural. Prayerful dependence. So obviously that one plays into the first three and then plays into everything you do growing out of that. Because as we know, we plant and we water and we pray. And he's the one that leads a single mom to a party. He's the one that gives her the motivation to the next thing. He's the one that gives her the motivation to ask for help with childcare. He's the one that gives her the confidence to talk to other teachers in the teacher's lounge, right? So there's some things here we need to do to create the environment to help cultivate the soil, but the whole thing's gotta be wrapped up in prayerful dependence. For the people we're living life with as Christians, as family, we all need that to stay unified, to love each other well, because even other Christians are hard to, love sometimes so we need to be prayerful for each other as christians as family and then we really need to be extra prayerful for all the seed planting and all the watering we're doing but mike when you get clarity about who the mission is those 10 to 15 people that clarifies prayer now you've got very specific people to pray for. You know their stories increasingly. So you know what is broken in their lives. You know what their questions are. You know where their unbelief is. So you just increasingly are able to pray for them. I think better and better. If there's a better way to pray. I think there is actually. I don't think it's bad to pray generally. But I think. It's even better to pray specifically for specific people, specific unbelief they have, specific doubts they have. So those are the irreducibles. And it, it's actually universal. I mean, I can literally give you examples from 20 different countries right now about how that is actually working out in different soils 
big cities, smaller towns, different ethnicities, black, white, Estonian, Romanian, South African. Um, that's what's cool about it, though, is God's design in all of this is that we, if we as Christians and we as leaders of the church will just organize ourselves in some basic ways and commit to those things consistently. I mean, same thing for you, Steve, with Muslims. There's nothing different here. I, I work, I work, I talked with a guy in Australia two weeks ago that's working with Muslims, a bunch of Iranians, and I think from a, the other parts of the Middle East. No different. He's doing exactly what we're talking about here. Missional communities, shared leadership, clear mission focus, 10 to 15 non-Christian Muslims, eating meals with them, inviting them to appropriate relational spaces where they can build in to those relationships, get to know their stories, become trusted friends with those Muslims. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing some beautiful fruit. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. One of the one of the Iranians that just became a Christian, he's like, man, I'm ready to start a missional community. How do I do that to other my other Iranian Muslim friends? He's like been a believer for like six months. He wants to start a missional community on mission to his Muslim Iranian friends living in Melbourne, Australia. Oh, hallelujah. Beautiful. I walked in on Steve's group Friday night. He has a group uh, that he's coming against some of these individuals who, that they've made contact with. And uh, in, in that room, there are uh, Palestinians, there are Jews. There, <laughs> it was, I, it blew my mind what Jesus was doing there. And love it. So it, it is great. Love it. I don't uh, don't want to cut this short, except we have met our hour. So if there's any last minute comments or questions that anybody wants to make that really they feel they have to get off their chest before we hang up with each other, we want to keep our commitment to the time. All right. Well, I would encourage you to take this back to your people. Have a simple conversation and say, what can this look like in our context? What I always tell churches, you've got to contextualize. So Anaheim, Costa Mesa, Irvine, what is the proper contextualized version for these five relational environments? There's options. They might look different from city to city, place to place, but there, there will be options for you at, you know, with all five of these relational spaces. This isn't just a, a missional reality. This is actually a sociological study on, on where people fit in this spectrum. So this is, like Todd said, this is, every, no matter where you go, this is a reality. So one of the questions you may want to do is a group to sit around the table and say, what, what environments are we missing as a congregation? We do well at this one, we A plus, or we do, we get an F. What do we need to do? We don't even have this one. And so how do we, how do we create that? That's, that could be a good uh, leadership conversation around your tables where you guys are. Love it. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, Derek, can I ask you to pray for us as we leave? Absolutely. Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we thank you for just this message of community, of mission community, Lord, um, that the goal is to um, soften hard spiritual ground, Lord, that we can plant, yeah. um, we can bring to a harvest for you lord we know there's so many lost souls out there heavenly father that are just looking for that community lord um they're they're hurt 
or they're lost and they just they don't know what to do lord um help us be mindful that the focus is to love them lord yeah that uh just having an open and willing heart lord to give to them and to share with them um and bring them into these groups lord help us um as leaders um step into that role lord but also help us inside of our own churches lord fortify these these groups lord help us um take inventory of what we need to do to have these different types of groups lord that it's a collective lord and um having not just one lord but all of them will benefit you heavenly father yeah we pray that all the churches in california and all the states and even all the countries lord that are hearing this message lord can be uh, can utilize this teaching lord and bring more souls to you heavenly father we pray all this in your holy name amen amen Thanks, Derek. Yeah. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Todd, thanks for leading us. Again, we do this once a quarter online, but um, you can uh, get Todd with your uh, congregation just as with your leadership team to be more specific on some of the issues your leadership team may be uh, um, in, interested in talking about. And then also, again, if you have a congregation, any of you or not, that wants to join us, invite them to the conversation, and uh, we'd love to Love to uh, have him join us. Uh, sorry if you heard, my, I, I have a puppy who's pretty much a toddler at this point and he, he can only stand me not playing with him for so long and he, you probably heard him growling. So <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Anyway. Thank you, Todd. Yeah, good to be